you're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode 41. Uh, before I introduce tonight's special guest, just want to let everybody know uh, that there's a lot more going in the background. So uh, I apologize in advance if, it's, uh, if you can hear it. I certainly can. Uh, let me know in the chat if it's uh, bearable. Hopefully the gentleman stops soon and uh, his grass is looking nice and we're all good over here. So let's hope for a win-win situation. Um, with that out of the way, with that, with that out of the weeds, uh, I, I'm sorry I had to. Um, just want to let everybody know that uh, Havana Palace on Huron Church Road in Windsor, Ontario, Canada is the official sponsor for the Holy Smokes podcast. So if you guys would be so kind as to visit facebook.com slash Havana Palace and give them a like, I uh, would much appreciate it. It's a family-owned and operated cigar shop, fine selection, the best prices, and the best service. So if you could do that for me, it'd be much appreciated. Um, so I have with me tonight, uh, back for the second time, my very great pleasure, uh, Dr. Jim Papandrea. Uh, how are you doing tonight, Jim, with your glass of wine? I'm, I'm doing great. Cheers. Cheers, brother. Uh, great to have you back. So uh, last time we discussed kind of, you know, some themes in the early church, uh, how the early church worship might have looked and, and that sort of a thing and the sort of the general cultural context in which Christianity started to flourish. Uh, but we're going to go on to a bit more specifics tonight. Uh, I titled the video The Papacy in the First Millennium, so we'll definitely uh, go over some highlights there uh, on the papacy. And we might talk about some other stuff too, about uh, maybe this, you know, sacramental theology um, and things of that sort. So um, to start off, um, what would you say to somebody who um, says, you know, I read the New Testament, I see that Peter's mentioned kind of in the form of lists, he's kind of there primarily at the top, uh, he preaches on Pentecost. And that sort of a thing, but I don't really see um, anything for Roman primacy. Let's say I could sit, I could see Peter as an individual, but where do we get this idea that P Petrine primacy equals Roman primacy in the New Testament? Is there anything that can be gleaned from that? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the the first thing I would say is I, I would add to the examples you already gave. You know, don't forget that Peter is one of the sort of inner circle of Jesus's disciples. So he's one of the, the top three, if you will. Peter, James, and John, they're at the transfiguration. Um, you know, they're, the, they're at the empty tomb. Um, and, you know, Peter is the one uh, whom, even though he has denied Jesus, he's the one who's reconciled to Jesus in, in, at the end of John's gospel. And the one that Jesus says about him, you know, uh, you you are the one that's going to strengthen your brothers, and uh, you are the one that's going to feed my sheep. And so, so there is definitely a sense that Peter is the leader of the apostles. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, after the time of the New Testament, um, as the gospel spreads, what you have is an association of various apostles with certain cities. And so this becomes very important. Now you you don't see it in the New Testament because the it's it's a little bit early for that, and and um, even the Book of Acts was written too early to uh, you know to to get this. But um, you know, but it's clear from the early Christian documents that you know certain cities came to prominence as centers of Christianity, at least you know in the mind the collective mind of the church and those centers of Christianity were all associated with apostles. And the reason for that is because the authority of the teaching in that city had to be understood to go back to Jesus himself through the apostles. So, you know, if you're a Christian in Alexandria, say, you know, someone might say, well, how do I know what you're telling me is, is true about Christianity? And your answer would be, well, you know, I learned it from my bishop who learned it from his bishop who learned it from a direct disciple of the apostles. And this apostle is associated with my city and the succession of bishops in that city. Peter is the apostle associated with the city of Rome. 
Now, he's also, to some extent, associated with the city of Antioch, um, but especially Rome. And again, you have to remember just how important it was to the original Christians when someone died in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when the apostles died and where they died and where their tomb is, that becomes really important. And so the city of Rome is the place where both Peter and Paul were martyred and buried, and their tombs are still there to this day. And so, um, you know, when you put all of that together uh, with the fact that Peter, we know, was the first, ap uh, the first apostle in Rome. Now, mm -hmm. we, we don't say that he's the first Christian in Rome. It's not like he brought Christianity to Rome. Yeah. Uh, there were there were Christians in Rome before Peter got there. Mm -hmm. Peter gets to Rome in about the year 42, um, and he becomes the first apostolic authority in the city of Rome, which is why we call him the first bishop of Rome. And so he is mm -hmm. that apostle on whose authority the ongoing teaching of Christianity in the city of Rome is based. Okay. So it's... Um, the See, because the thing is, people have said, when they're trying to sort of argue for the um, equality of all bishops, um, and, and in a sense, that's true, because bishops, there's not a super bishop and a bishop. Bishops, qua bishops, are, are bishops, right? But in a sense of one bishop having some sort of primacy over the others, they'll say, well, you know, Alexandria and Antioch um, are both uh, patrine sees as well as Rome. So basically, wherever Peter touched down and moved through, uh, that is equally a Petrine Sea as Rome is. So why give deference to Rome? But you you kind of you alluded to it already because you said it's where the apostle dies, right? So is that why Rome is given prominence? Because that's where Peter sheds his blood. I mean, that that is a big part of it. That really is. Um, and, uh, and, and so... Yeah, I mean, to to your point, you know, the Bishop of Rome is considered by the church to be the successor of Peter, but in a way he's also the successor of Paul in the sense that Paul was also martyred there. So so all of that gets added to the equation. And, you know, I, in, in my uh, video series that I'm doing lately, the, the original church, you know, I like to keep reminding people, there's nothing wrong with asking the question, should we see the Bishop of Rome as the, as the Bishop of Bishops. But I want to get back to the question, you know, did the early church see the Bishop of Rome as the Bishop of Bishops? You know, it's, and, and the, the evidence is that they did. And so right. then we have to ask the question, you know, how much should we base what we believe on what they believed? Because it is clear that the church fathers saw Rome as the, the primary uh, the primary C and the primary authority in the church. And when do we start um, seeing that authority kind of exercise and start to manifest itself in the in the primary sources in the early church fathers? When do we kind of start to see this? And we we could point to something and say, and, and you know, people will accuse us of quote mining and this, that, and the third. But like, what can we can we point to some sort of clear examples to say, no, 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 this is really what is going on here. This is faithful to the intent of the author. Yeah, I mean, the, the earliest uh, example I would give is already still in the first century. Uh, it's the letter that uh, Clement of Rome wrote to the church at Corinth. Um, it's usually referred to as First Clement, um, right. although the letter we call Second Clement is probably not by Clement. So anyway, um, First Clement, though, was written by Clement of Rome, who was Bishop of Rome from about uh 88 or so to maybe 98 somewhere in there right and um and he writes this letter to the church at Corinth and now you know yes we can pull quotes out of it that uh that show us that he felt he was writing with the authority of the apostle Peter and his uh succession but also just the whole fact of the existence of the letter, the, the, mm -hmm. the fact that he felt he had the right to write a letter 
to the Christians in Corinth, a, a city, by the way, the church where the church that Paul founded and in, in writing them and telling them what to do and sort of schooling them on the basis of his authority as the Bishop of Rome. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was some drama going on in Corinth over um, the, the the clergy. And it, it seems like if I had to guess based on, you know, what Clement does say in his letter, it seems like there's a younger generation coming up in the, in the church in Corinth mm -hmm. who, who don't want the office, uh, the, the, the clergy to be a lifelong office. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to get some old guys out and bring some new guys in or something. And so they're trying to squeeze people who have been, um, you know, clergy, uh, priests in the city of Corinth out, or at least one in any case, uh, maybe even the Bishop of Corinth, uh, they're trying to squeeze him out and put somebody else in. And basically, you know, Clement writes as Bishop of Rome to them with the authority to tell them to cut it out. And he then sends a delegation he doesn't go himself, but he sends a delegation to Corinth to sort it out, again, on his authority as the Bishop of Rome. So we're already seeing that even during the time when this is right about the same time that the book of Revelation was being written. Yeah, so still exactly. within the New Testament period. So I mean, right there. And, and Clement is only a couple of bishops away from Peter. In other words, uh, you know, depending on who you read, there's only you know, one or two bishops of Rome in between Peter and Clement. And according to the tradition, Clement knew Peter um, yep. and may have been a, a disciple of his directly. So, right. Yeah. It's like we kind of get the, uh, the precedent for uh, the Pope sending legates to ecumenical councils in that, uh, in that instance there. Um, That's right. You know, uh, I wanted to ask you, hope I didn't just lose my oh um before I go any further did you know what Clement's favorite fruits were Clementine it's a joke <laughs> I'm sorry I was wait I was waiting to, to pull that one out I'm sorry I, <laughs> what, are, what are Clement's favorite fruits Clementines what's oh, that Clementines oh you know that's that's funny that you say that because any, if any of your viewers have been to Rome or are planning to go, uh, the Church of San Clemente, which was St. Clement's, the site of St. Clement's Church, uh, right across the street, there's a restaurant called E Clementini, which is the Clementine. Clementine. One nice. of the best restaurants in Rome. Absolutely. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what I wanted to ask you regarding uh, Pope St. Clement. Uh, I've read some some of the literature that suggests, uh, for example, okay, we think of Pope St. Clement, we think of a uh, mono-episcopal system here, right? Uh, one bishop, and he's the bishop of Rome, and that's it. But I've read elsewhere that by this time in the church's nascent history, it was it wasn't a mono episcopacy yet. It was just you know a ruling council of elders, and, and one of the guys was basically chosen to speak as the mouthpiece for this council of elders. Uh, what about that? Is that is there any truth to that, or how might that fit into the story, or jive with it, or not? Yeah, that's a great question. You've kind of hit it at um, the heart of an issue um, that uh, I'm working on a revision of one of my books. This is this is sort of the Alan Brent theory. Alan Brent's a scholar who who wrote a book on uh, the mono episcopacy. And you know, for a while when I was a student, I was kind of enamored of this um, until I really started thinking through the logic of it. Because on the one hand, he's got some good arguments that in some places there may have been, let's say instead of one bishop, there may have been sort of a leader of, let's say, the Greek-speaking Christians and another leader of the Latin-speaking Christians or something like that. And um, Or uh, an even stronger argument is, that, and, and we know this is a reality, that there are councils of priests. So, yeah. for example, in the, in the writings of, um, like, Hippolytus, you know, and, and some others, they talk about the heretics being called 
not before the bishop, but before a council of priests. Now, presumably the bishop is there, of course, as the chair of that council. Yeah. But I think that there, I think that there is some truth to the idea of, of these, these councils of priests. The problem with the Alan Brent theory is it does not take into account the fact that when you have a city like Rome that had an apostle in it, the disciple that that apostle chooses to lead after him is absolutely going to be the mon the you know mm. the monarchical authority in yeah. that in that city so if peter is in rome and he's about to be martyred and he says okay guys linus here is going to take over after me yeah. well there is no council of priests that's going to override the authority of the person that Peter has designated. If Paul is out is, is out there and he leaves town and he says, "Okay, I'm leaving Timothy in charge." Yeah, Timothy is the bishop. It's now the, the, yeah, right. the the so, council of priests thing could still fit into that framework in the sense that they're going to assist him, right? right? But they're not going to usurp him or like somehow be on par with him, right? It, both and, are going to fit in. And and what you have to remember about the early church is that almost nothing is the same across the board in every city. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a city that did not have an apostle as its founder, well, it could very well be that, you know, there is a council of priests and perhaps they elect one of their own to sort of function as the chair, yeah. but maybe it takes a while to evolve to the point where that person is an authority over them as opposed to a representative of them. So, you know, there's, there's, there's not necessarily one way that it happened everywhere in the Roman Empire. Right. Uh, but, but what you have to understand is, you know, the reality that Rome, especially with Peter as its first apostle, mm -hmm. you know, that changes everything. I mean, that, that just sort of uh, affects everything. Yeah, absolutely. The, the whole, the, the Alan Brent theory is really based on his study of Hippolytus. And, and I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, he's a great scholar and his, his stuff is good to read, but what he, what he does is he looks at Hippolytus in the third century mm -hmm. who refers to himself as a bishop. And he says, aha, there are two bishops of Rome because there's Hippolytus and there's Callistus or Zephyrinus, right? Yeah. Well, it's more likely that Hippolytus was the bishop of a smaller town outside of Rome oh, okay. under the authority of the Roman bishop as the metropolitan. Right. He's still a bishop because what, what Hippolytus is so mad about is that Hippolytus is excommunicating people in his smaller town who are then just going to Rome yep. and getting reconciliation from, from the bishop of Rome. Right, right. Um, and Hippolytus is is one of our early church rigorists. So let's say, let's say you're a priest, and in those days, priests some priests had wives. Let's say you're a priest and you you get a divorce and yeah. you get remarried. Hippolytus is going to say you cannot be a priest anymore, except that it actually happened where there were priests who would then move into the city, the big city, go to the bishop there, and the bishops of Rome, the popes. We're letting these guys remain as priests, even though they were divorced and remarried. And this was blowing Hippolytus's mind. And so he's railing against the bishops of Rome. Um, oh, this is what led to the schism, eh? Well, yeah. Well, so, I mean, sort you of know, this. this is why Hippolytus is, is sometimes called in the older books an anti pope. Mm -hmm. But really, I think he's just the bishop of a smaller town. But the problem for him is since. Since he's close to Rome, and since Rome is Rome, he's still under the authority of the Bishop of Rome, and he has to he has to submit, and he doesn't like it. See, I like that nuance because that really sort of makes sense of the thing. And versus, oh, he's a bishop, and there's the Bishop of Rome over here. They're both bishops; it's one city. It, it's more nuanced than that. I'm glad that you uh, fleshed that out a little bit for us. Uh, yeah, Teresa, and I mean, you know, oh, you know. I'm sorry, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Teresa said, didn't Corinth write to Clement first? And he, I mean, we don't have a record of of that correspondence, but I think it's safe to probably assume that they appealed to him, right? And he was responding. Yeah, somebody did. Somebody um, did. And it's, you know, it's very much like Paul's letters where he's 
you know, the, the Apostle Paul is is writing letters in response to other letters, which we don't have. So it's always a little bit like listening to one half of a phone conversation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And she says, uh, wasn't the Apostle John still living? Yes, that's true. Yes, he was, yeah. um, which which is an interesting point, because whoever and maybe this is where you're going with this, Teresa, but who, you know, whoever wrote to Clement for help didn't write to John. Right. Right. Now, you know, presumably that could be because John's imprisoned on the island of Patmos at this time. And so, I mean, you know, there could be reasons, but they wrote to Clement. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't write to, to a living apostle. Um, pr presumably they, they, they might have been able to, but like you said, he could have been the, the exile might've proven, uh, proven that a little bit difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it depends how you date the book of revelation, but based right. on my study and I have studied it, um, I date the book of revelation, like almost at the exact same time that Clement is writing first Clement. Right. And when did you, uh, you said that around the 80s? Well, it would have been no, a little bit later. Clement became bishop uh, in the late 80s, but the letter was written in about 95. 95, yeah. And then she says, uh, exactly, that's the, one of the things I use. In, yeah, exactly. The nice, appeal yeah. to Clement, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was going to ask you this as well. Uh, maybe... Maybe save it for a bit later, but I was I was going to go into this whole thing about proto. <laughs> I know you hate this, so I wanted to do it on purpose. Not playing uh, proto -orth proto orthodoxy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's presume that you have an interlocutor who said who comes to you and says, "Jim, okay, it's fine that you know you have these guys claiming apostolic tradition and they have they have succession lists and that's all well and good, but you have these." groups these other groups who are also claiming apostolic pedigree or to have some sort of special knowledge from some sort of apostolic teacher or tradition so what makes you think that it's this particular group that is on the straight and narrow and all these other guys are wrong isn't that just isn't that just who won out and who wrote the history kind of you, you got i'm sure you've heard this line of argumentation yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, right. And I mean, you know, there's there's a couple things behind that, um, you know, and uh, going back all the way to some, you know, some scholars who uh, started talking about um, many Christianities. Mm -hmm. There were many Christianities in the early church with the with the assumption that they were all equally valid. Right. And um, of course, I, I reject that idea. Um, they were not all equally valid. Um and uh, you have other scholars who read Gnostic texts as though they are somehow as historically accurate or useful as the canonical um, documents in, in the New Testament. And I, I would, you know, argue against that as well. And it, it all comes down to this sort of idea that, um, that there was no orthodoxy from the beginning right. and that there were many different points of view, even mutually exclusive points of view that were all equally acceptable yep. in the early church. Now, the evidence just doesn't support that. Um, you know, when you read the documents, uh, you can see that the church fathers have a clear sense of what is orthodoxy, what is correct teaching, and what is false teaching. Now, Again, to your point, a person could argue, well, you know, that's just the winners, you know, framing the argument. That's yeah. just the, the uh, you know, the, the winners of the argument, um, their documents were preserved and uh, they somehow, you know, silenced um, yeah. all the other voices. This is what I call the myth of silenced voices. Yeah. Um, again, the evidence doesn't support that um, because the... The, the ones we call the heretics, uh, were anything but silent. Uh, we yeah. know what they wrote. We have some of their writings. Um, we know what they were doing with the scriptures, which was basically cut and paste, you know, yep. um, writing their own documents, putting apostles' names on them. And, um, and so, you know, when you actually look at the primary sources, what we call the primary sources, the documents from the early church, 
mm-hmm. from that time. When you actually read the documents and look into the history, what you find is that the uh, the the alternative interpretations that we refer to as heresies were um, minority groups on the fringes of the church, and the teachings that we call orthodoxy were the teachings that were passed down through what we call the mainstream of the church. Now, again, you know, a person would argue against the, the very idea of a mainstream church, but the evidence supports that the vast majority of people followed the bishops in succession from the apostles and that there was a mainstream church. Now, it's very interesting because people who want to argue for you know, many Christianities yeah. are often doing that out of a sense of democracy, like somehow all ideas should be equally valid. Right. Um, but of course, no one really wants to say all ideas are equally valid. Racism is not equally valid with other ideas. So nobody right. believes all ideas are equally valid. The truth is, if you want to see democracy in the early church, see it in the fact that the majority of the church was the mainstream church. And the majority of the church followed the mainstream bishops, and um, you know the the, uh, the these fringe groups were teaching alternatives that, at the end of the day, were picking and choosing, right? Yeah. And I mean, you know, the easiest example is, you know, on one extreme you have people who said Jesus was human and not divine. On the other extreme, you had the people who said he was divine but not human, and they. They, they refuse to hold the two together, and they pick and choose. Yeah. And the mainstream church said, no, it's both. Jesus is human and divine, fully human and fully divine. And so the mainstream church is the church that reads all the scriptures and holds them all together, yeah. but refuses to include in its Bible the documents that were forged, right? And, right. and the mainstream church is the church that refuses to throw out this group of of scripture texts in favor of this one or vice versa. And at the end of the day, there's also an element of faith in it. And, you know, and and here's what I tell people, you know, Jesus told Peter, he said, you are the rock on this rock. I'm going to build my church. And then he, and then he made the promise. You know, we all focus on the rock thing, but focus for a minute on the promise and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And to me, that says that, the Holy Spirit would guide the church. And I believe the Holy Spirit has guided the church. And so the mainstream of the church is faithful and has never gone off the rails enough to become something other than the church. Because if it had, then then you got to ask the question, when did Jesus stop keeping that promise? Yeah. And then you run into a whole host of problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, jumping back into um, the papacy then, um you know what about you know some people bring up the early roman succession list and say well how legitimate can this apostolic succession from peter be when seemingly uh some of the lists don't agree with each other for example um have you have you investigated that at all well a little bit and it is true you know the the church fathers irenaeus and these guys they're not infallible they were not right. writing scripture. It, at one point, Irenaeus thinks that Jesus's ministry took place during the reign of the emperor Claudius, which it did not. Uh, so, you know, he gets his history wrong at times. Um, and the other thing you have to remember is that uh, guys like Irenaeus, and especially w- later when you get to Eusebius, who is our kind of our first real Christian historian. Yeah. You know, if they weren't there, they're pulling from tradition. And Eusebius is is actually kind of amazing because he contradicts himself, not because he doesn't know what he's talking about, but because he's got documents with two different traditions. The, 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 so what does he do? He includes them both. Um, so it, it it's true that there you know there are some fuzzy areas in the historical record, um, but I don't think that obscures the fact that there is an unbroken succession. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There were, there were times there were, there were gaps when, uh, a bishop was a bishop of Rome was martyred and they couldn't elect a new one for a year, year and a half or whatever, yeah. uh, because of persecution or whatever. So, um, but, but still, 
the the succession and and even the authority isn't in the person per se but in the office that is yeah. in that that place and so you know there was no time when the church at rome did not have the the teaching being handed down and you know one of the church fathers arguments for the primacy of rome is that rome never had heresy in its leadership i mean you can you can point to antioch you can point to alexandria you can point to constantinople all the other major cities all had points in their history when the bishop of that city was a heretic yeah not wrong true not wrong that's right i mean there uh, are accusations but they're not true yeah they're unsubstantiated exactly yeah um okay well uh yeah i mean like you said there might be and i i think from what i recall the differences in those lists i think we're just in the order of like the first few bishops it's not even it doesn't substantially change anything it's just like, oh, this guy preceded this guy, and they kind of got the order mixed up a little bit. But it doesn't change anything. You know, it's kind of it, like it's kind of like people who say, uh, oh, the, you know, uh, there's there's different Bible manuscripts. But when you, it's, uh, you know, throwing shade at the Bible that it's unreliable. But when you look at it, the the content of of those uh, manuscript differences, it's like a letter here and a letter there. It doesn't change anything. Right. Right. Yeah. The the t- text variants, as we call them, don't change mm-hmm. the meaning. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so moving on from Clement, then, uh, what about Ignatius? Uh, does does he have anything to say about about the Roman Church? That's yeah, noteworthy. He he does. Um, he you know what we have from Ignatius of Antioch uh, is a series of letters that he wrote while he was being taken under guard from Antioch to Rome to be martyred, yeah. um, and uh, so. He writes these letters to Christians in other cities, and one of his letters is to the Christians at Rome. Of course, he hadn't been; he wasn't there yet. He was on his way, and um, he uh, he he seems to praise the church at Rome much more than any other. Uh, he seems to give it uh, a primacy that he doesn't give the other churches. And uh, again, I think, you know, one of the most significant things that, that, at least off the top of my head, is like I mentioned earlier, he, it's important to him that Peter and Paul died there, right? right? And, um, and this is, a, this is a, a theme that gets repeated over and over through, throughout the Church Fathers, that, you know, you Romans, you church at Rome are so blessed to have the tombs of Peter and Paul, right? And by the way, I still hear about people who say, oh, there's no evidence, you know, that Peter was ever in Rome. Yeah. His tomb is there. It's been there from the beginning. Yeah. Christians have known where it was from, you know, the day he died. It, you know, so, I mean, anyone who says there's no evidence, yeah, they, they're not, they're not looking at the evidence. People so, who continually uh, make that claim, I don't, I don't get it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What about you know? Speaking of Peter and Paul, you know, what about the whole Peter, the, the, the double mention here? I mean, you know, someone could say, oh, you, you, Peter's supposed to be so important to Rome and the successor of Peter, but why is uh, why is Paul mentioned alongside him all the time? Doesn't that take away from the the Petrine supremacy element or the Petrine primacy element? Well, it's a fair question. Uh, I would answer it like this. Um, the fact that Paul is mentioned along with Peter adds to the prestige of the city of Rome as the primary see. The fact that the Bishop of Rome is called the successor of Peter and not the successor of Peter and Paul, for example, yes, I think has to do with the fact that Paul is not one of the original disciples. I mean, let's not forget that, right? He may have written most of the New Testament, but he is not one of the original disciples, and he only knew Jesus personally through his Damascus Road experience, right? So right. that's enough for him to claim apostolic authority, and that's fine. We'll give him that. But um, but but mm-hmm. Peter is still the leader of the apostles, you know, because he was there. That's a really good point, Jim. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I wanted to just read a little bit here. Um, Ignatius, so he writes in his epistle to the church at Rome, says, Ignatius, who is also called Theophorus to the church, which has obtained mercy through the majesty of the Most High Father and Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, the church which is beloved and enlightened by the will of him that wills all things which are according to the love of Jesus Christ our God, and this is interesting here, okay, so it says, which also presides in the place of the region of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of the highest happiness, worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy, and which presides in or over love. Now, that's an interesting uh, interesting phrase. He says, the, chur the church of Rome presides in love. Now, someone could ask, okay, well, presides in or over what? In love, is he talking about other churches in other cities, like other other local churches, or what? What's going on there? Do you think? You know, I I never really thought about that. I never looked that carefully at that verse uh, or that yeah that passage in the letter. Um, I think I always just sort of read past it as as you know like sort of pious uh, devotional speak. Um, yeah. I mean, I have not seen in it any kind of hint at authority over other churches. Um, although, uh, you know, clearly I think Ignatius sees that in Rome. Um, I don't know right. if that he's saying that in that passage, but I, I'll have to look at that. I want to, I want to check, you know, uh, check it in, in a couple of different translations in the original, you know, see what. Yeah. Cause the what reason, the, the reason I bring that up is because he's writing to a series of churches and then he says this, about Rome at the same time he's writing about other churches. So I, part of me thinks, well, maybe he's speaking in rel those relative terms to the churches that he's already addressed, he, like like Rome presides over them in charity or something like that. That's kind of how I might, yeah. might see it. I mean, it could be, it. you know, he his tone, as you know, he, he takes this tone of extreme humility. You yeah. know, I'm nobody. I'm just, just now that I'm a confessor, I'm just beginning to be a disciple. Um, I, you know, uh, and, and, but, but here's the thing when he's talking to the churches of other cities, he has no problem sp speaking to them as though he has some authority over them. Right. But when he's speaking to the Christians at Rome, he doesn't do that. He, right. he basically says, you know, now I don't have the authority to speak to you like it, like as if I were Peter or Paul. Right. That's right. So. Can we read into that? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, I think there's something significant there. It might not be um, really explicit, but there could, there certainly could be something to that. Uh, and yeah. we mentioned uh, St. Irenaeus, and he says, and, you know, if anyone says, oh, you know, this uh, this Roman primacy going back to Peter and Paul, that, that doesn't really show up in the early sources in a meaningful way, let's say. Um St. Irenaeus goes on to say, and against heresies, that he says, but since it would be too long to enumerate in such a volume as this, the succession of all the churches, we shall confound those who, in whatever manner, uh, whether through self-satisfaction or vainglory or through blindness and wicked opinion, assemble other than where it is proper by pointing out here the successions of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome by the most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, that church which has the tradition and faith which comes down to us after having been announced by men by the apostles. With that, now this is interesting here, with that church, because of its superior origin, all the churches must agree, that is, all the faithful in the whole world, and it is in her, the church of Rome, that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition. So he says, literally, all the faithful of the world must agree with the church at Rome because of its superior yeah. origin. That's... Right, which which is funny because, you know, he he talks about the, the the church at Rome being the most ancient, and and actually Jerusalem is the most ancient. I mean, if you think about it, right. Uh, but but the bishop of Jerusalem, you know, the founding bishop of Jerusalem. Is uh, is another person who wasn't actually one of the twelve, right? It's James. Um, so, uh, so I, I think what's going on here, and what we always have to keep in mind, is this: 
w- even with this concept of apostolic succession, where you have this assumption that, you know, whatever is being taught in any given city comes originally from the apostle who, who founded the church in that city or who was the founding apostle in that city. Yeah. Eventually, disagreements do come up. And eventually, even some bishops go off on a heretical tangent. So the question is, you know, what happens when the bishops of two cities disagree and they can both claim a pedigree going back to an apostle? Well, the answer to that question is the the tiebreaker is always Peter. Yeah. Because Peter's the, the leader of the apostles. So even if two other apostolic sees should disagree, the one who's right is the one that agrees with Rome. That is just simply the way it played out. You know, whether a person thinks it should be that way or not, that is how it played out. Yes. And then we have councils declaring that that the Bishop of Rome is sort of the last court of appeals for other bishops who disagree. And yes. so it is, it's literally codified in the, the canons of the councils. Yes, and I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking specifically of uh, the Council of Sardica, where um, it's just that. They stipulate that if there's bishops who disagree with one another, uh, well, first of all, deference is given to them at the local level. Say, hey, guys, you know, try and work this out if you can. If you can't, you can send it up to Rome, and then Rome might tell you, you guys got to play nice and work it out. And if you can't, Rome will make the final decision and whatever she says is law. Like that's basically, and what they said was this was already, this was prior custom, but it formally became enshrined at the council of, it wasn't invented at Sardica, right? They were drawing on a previous tradition. Right. I mean, because again, it all is based on this assumption that, you know, apostolic succession requires uh, the authority of an apostle behind whatever your argument is, but if but if two apostolic um, sees disagree, Peter is always the one who who is the the uh, the authority, and um, and and eventually you even have situations where you know a heretical bishop or a heretical emperor will come to power. And exile a bishop from his own from his own see. So you know, Athanasius yeah. gets exiled from Alexandria, and there are other cases. And where do they all go? Right. To Rome. Right. So when a legitimate bishop is exiled from his see or kicked out or forcibly removed, even in the East, they go to Rome for you know justice. Right. Yes. Yes. And I've heard the argument that you know, fine, Rome was an appellate court, no problem. That's only because the church gave them that prerogative. But if you if you read the canons of Sardica, they're saying it's based off of the memory of the blessed apostle Peter. It's nothing to do with the church granting Rome a concession or you know something of that nature. It's it's based solely on Rome or the Ro- the occupant of the Roman chair being the successor of Peter. That's what they're drawing on. That's right. That's right. And it's it's not a political thing. Um, be, and, and I mean, you know, all of this sort of begs the question, like wh- when people want to argue so, so much against the idea that the Bishop of Rome is a kind of first among equals, um, like what's the motivation for, for being so opposed to that? I, you know, it's like, What's what's the problem with it? If if the evidence in the early church all points to this, yeah, um, you know what's the issue? Um, I mean, I'm I'm sure we could come up with some ideas, but but I think the the argument, well, clearly the burden of proof is on the one who would want to say that, you know, that that Roman primacy is not really a thing, and you know, I would want to ask what, like, why are you so motivated to argue against it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So I have uh, my good uh, friend, virtual friend, Haley Luya. She says, okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate here or, okay. argue, or argue the common Orthodox claim. Okay. Um, all right, let's go. You know, it, it's funny, Jim, before, before Haley asked her question, I was just going to say, 
with regard to the primacy of honor or first among equals you know the, the common assumption when you hear that phrase is it, it's a it's a it's like a regal title it's a it's like a symbolic vestiture but it's not anything with teeth that would have actually that actually would have been foreign that idea would be foreign to the to the church of the empire primacy with no teeth with no uh with no force to do anything is is not like kind of like uh, the Japanese emperor, I don't know. Uh, that's not how that works. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it. you know, even though I said that the authority is not in the person, but in the office and in the city, it still kind of depends on the person in that office, how much they want to lord it over their colleagues versus... Yeah you know, be, be a, a, a servant, servant right? to yeah. the church. And let's face it, um, as much as we would like to think that the Holy Spirit uh, rigs the elections for popes, yeah. um, there have been some bad popes. Not recently, Absolutely. but there have been, yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah. So before Haley asks the question, though, I do want to say that um, I do believe that the Orthodox Church has as much right to claim apostolic succession of course. Uh, as the Western church. Of right? course. So, yeah. um, so then it just becomes a question of patriarchy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. And that's what our, that's what our uh, beloved church teaches. There are our sister churches and they, they have valid sacraments, valid holy orders, et cetera, and so on. So yeah, of course I agree. Yeah. Um, so Haley, uh, let's see, here she comes. Uh, let's see here. So there are no bishops that agree. Before Bat Vatican I, the church fathers had lots of claims and many disagree. How can we prove one is true over the other? Okay, Haley, when you say there are no bishops that agree before Vatican I, are you talking about agree on the the extent of paper, papal power? Um, I, I, what do you mean exactly when you say that? I, I just want to clarify that part of it. I'm sure we're going to get into Vatican one in a bit, but uh, I just want to get some clarification on that one. Uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming that because uh, you know papal infallibility wasn't defined until 1870, that uh, yeah. nobody had like a con a clear, concise idea of what that even was, or if it could be exercised, or how, or d was it even a thing you know was was rome yeah, yeah. the the primate but they they could they could make uh you know errors of faith and morals I, i'm not sure um oh here she says uh yes many had different views of papal power okay well let's let's talk about that um you know one thing i i would just preface because that's a very it's a very good question now you can look at it like this right so one could say playing devil's advocate let's say you're an easterner and you say well not every easterner always assented or consented to papal decrees the fact that they thought they could resist the pope or not listen to him was evidence enough that they didn't view the pope as the bishop of bishops let's say but the question becomes now if i if i follow that purely logically i could say well, how many people today and throughout history haven't listened to God, haven't obeyed the will of God? Does that mean that God doesn't have the rightful authority that he has because people don't listen to him? No, I, I don't think that follows at all. Um, and furthermore, what I would maybe add is from the very first, the self-understanding of the bishops of Rome was such that they understood themselves to have such power. That is significant. And all of those popes in the first seven, uh, first, uh, seven centuries, eight centuries, most of them are canonized Eastern Orthodox saints. So they're saints, yet they, they believe to have this, this supremacy over the church. So either they're correct in their doctrine here, or from the very early first days of the church, Rome had a heretical view of herself, but nobody seemed to notice. So there's a lot of there's a lot at stake here. Um, yeah. Well, you know the the 
the issue between East and West is is super complicated because yeah. because once Constantine moves the capital of the empire from Rome to Byzantium and you know it becomes Constantinople, right? A yep. couple of things happen. Um, the the authority of the Bishop of Rome only escalates at that point, but it sets the church on a path where the church in the West is going to be a the, the church is going to be above government in the hierarchy of things, right? Yep. Church over empire, but in the East. It's going to be the other way around, empire, empire or church. church. Yeah. And so there's always going to be, sorry uh, to our Orthodox uh, brothers and sisters, but there's always going to be a kind of a jealousy on the part of Eastern patriarchs about the power of Rome. And then they start vying for power between themselves. So um, it, thankfully, you, you cannot argue that the fourth century councils of Nicaea and Constantinople were influenced by, you know, power struggles. But the fifth century councils, that's another story. And, you know, while, you know, we accept the, the third council of, of Ephesus, um, the council of Chalcedon in 451, there was so much politics going on there between Alexandria and Constantinople that the that our church the, the catholic church has now declared well not just now but you know in the last century that uh, these non-chalcedonian churches are validly christian even yep. though they reject the council of chalcedon even though we accept it as an ecumenical council and part of the reason for that is because a a, a big part of the reason for the schism that took place after that was over the this politics and so, unfortunately, the idea of being the bishop in a city and the idea of being a politician in that city gets intertwined too much, um, especially in some of these eastern major cities. So um, as far as, you know, the, the question whether bishops agreed before Vatican I, I think there is, well, first of all, let me say this. Yeah. When we talk about what the church fathers taught— I have to reiterate, the church fathers are not infallible. They right. were not writing scripture, and some saints could be wrong about things. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about what the church fathers taught, we're really talking about consensus. You know, you can't you can't ever say they all agree. Well, there are a few things they all agreed on, um, yeah. and I would put the the real presence of the of the blessed sacrament in that category. There, there are a few things that they, that they all agreed on, but for the most part, it's hard to say they all agreed on everything on anything, but where we see consensus of the mainstream, that's where we can talk about. This is what the church fathers taught. And I think there is a consensus that not, not an individual Pope as a, as a man, but that the office carries a certain infallibility to it. And, you know, that's what they were doing at Vatican I when they, you know, when they sort of dogmatized the infallibility of the Pope. Right. But, you know, again, politics rears its ugly head because what was happening at the time of Vatican I? Mm -hmm. I mean, 1870 was the moment where the old order of kingdoms in Italy was ending and the, the, the modern nation of Italy was beginning. And in that moment, the Pope was losing almost all of his political power. Mm -hmm. And so what did, what did the Pope do at Vatican I? He basically said, and I'm not saying this was wrong for him to do. I'm just saying this is the reality. He basically said, okay, if I'm going to lose all this worldly temporal power, I'm going to clarify my spiritual power. Yeah. Yeah. And this is when they, you know, sort of codified or clarified the dogma of, of papal infallibility, uh, which, as you know, is defined by what we call a, an ex cathedra pronouncement or statement, um, and which, you know, the, this, this idea of making an ex cathedra infallible statement has been done exactly once since then. <laughs> so yeah. it's not even a thing that the popes, you know, um, use. Right. 
and we should we should be clear that when we're talking about infallibility of the pope i mean it's not so much the way i like to ex, ex sort of break it down is, is is this and you can tell me what you think so uh the church is infallible because the faith is infallible because christ is infallible christ the head and the body are one thing so when the church teaches infallibly that's christ teaching now there's one infallible faith as the object but there are several sort of let's say instrumental modes or instantiations of how that teaching that one teaching gets expressed all of them infallible but some are more common and some are more rare than others so if we go on a scale let's say the the ordinary way is like you know the bishop and his diocese for example then rarer still is an ecumenical council and rarer still is ex cathedra statements by the supreme pontiff but in any case this the object is the same the infallible faith is that which instrument in a particular instance is being used as the voice to proclaim that infallible faith sometimes it's the pope at the very top that's rare other times it's councils other times it's the bishop and his diocese but it's it's the one infallible faith i think is that a fair way to frame it what do you think uh, sure i mean I, I i don't have any problem with that i i think you know for me it all goes back to that promise of jesus the gates of hell mm -hmm. will not prevail against it which means that the holy spirit is guiding the church and even when we've had bad popes they uh they did not run the church off the rails to the point where it it ceased to be the church right and um and and so uh there is a certain i mean i believe there's a certain protection there for the church um but yeah so that when so that when a pope speaks the pope is infallible as he speaks for the church right i always tell my students you know if you had one of those if you had a jar of jelly beans right mm -hmm. and you said to the pope holy father guess how many jelly beans are in the jar papal infallibility does not mean that he would have to get it right right you know what i mean like that's not what we're talking about right um, uh, but when the pope speaks for the church um he's infallible precisely because he's speaking for the tradition right yes, yes um so he you know in a sense he he can't say anything that would uh that would deviate from the tradition right um, and uh, the whole thing about infallibility is like okay let's take the the definition of papal infallibility as an example right it just means free from error it doesn't mean it's worded in the best way it's not expressed in the most glorious way. It might not be, but it's preserved from being erroneous uh, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's all. Well, yeah, and I, I would go farther than that. I would say, you know, it also means that there has to be an intentionality in anything the Pope says. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of with the assumption that the Pope is is relying on the best advice of his uh of his cardinals and his his advisors as well so you know if a pope should say something off the cuff for example yeah um you know i'm i wouldn't want to hold hold that up to papal infallibility necessarily you know everything the pope says um right and he like you said he there this, uh, with regard to intentionality he has to intend to be binding the whole church to a definition it's not yeah. just you know he proclaims something and we decide we have to decide for ourselves oh is this is this infallible is this ex cathedra he, we're gonna know because he's gonna he's gonna make it binding and he's gonna make it clear that he's making it binding on the whole church and the holy spirit will not let him in that instance proclaim heresy this is what I think. And and if if we did have to judge the Pope's statements and say, oh, is is he right? Is he wrong? Is he a heretic? And, you know, as you know, there are people out there on the Internet doing that. Yes. You know, my response to them is, well, are, 
this, doesn't that make you the Pope then? It's like, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, but I, I, I want to, I want to hear from, uh, is it, is it Hallie? Uh, Haley, yeah. are, are we getting at uh, her question or did she have uh, more to ask? Uh, let's see. Uh, she said, okay. She said, she was talking to Teresa. She said, uh, Teresa says, who ended an argument by saying Peter has spoken? Oh, you're probably referring to, um, at, it was at the Council of Chalcedon mm -hmm. in year 451. And um, Pope Leo had sent a letter. It's usually referred to as Leo's tome, T-O-M-E. Um, but he had sent a letter. He had actually sent it to an earlier council where it had been uh, refused. Um, but at the Council of Chalcedon, the letter was read. In the letter, uh, Leo clarifies the language around the two natures of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he and Leo does say, you know, you, you probably should listen to me as though I were Peter. And then according to the story, um, when the, when they finished reading the letter in the council, the bishops in unison shouted, Peter has spoken. Um, yeah. Right. So, yeah. That's where that comes from. Now was there, uh, there was an issue over Canon 28 at the council, right? Was it Canon 28? And an Easterner had written to, I, I think it was Anatolios. I, I can't recall the name off the top of my head. But an Easterner had, had written to Leo. And he basically conceded, like, look, you have the full authority to annul canons of an ecumenical council. Well, yeah. So Leo did take upon himself you know, what we might call a line item veto uh authority uh on the canons of the council because he did not like uh canon 28 and um this is the one that has it help me remember this is the one that has to do with the, the authority of constantinople right yeah so yeah, what yeah. what ends up happening because you know the the original really important sees of the early church are of course rome antioch alexandria and you might throw jerusalem in there as well but once you have Constantinople as the capital of the empire, then that becomes important. And yeah. so um, this isn't the first time, though, because it seems to me at, at the Council of Constantinople as well in 381, there's a canon that says, on the one hand, admits that Rome is, is the primary see, the, the number one metropolitan, but then says, and Constantinople is second. Yeah. And you would think that the bishops of Rome would be all over that. They would love it because here is, a, you know, a canon of, a, of an ecumenical council affirming the authority. But they didn't like it because they didn't like that it put Constantinople uh, in that second position. Yeah, on the basis of political power. Yeah. Right? Not, yeah. Ap not, not apostolicity. Um, right, because there is no, there is no right. apostle founder of Constantinople. Right, exactly. And, and you know, people make the argument that um, Rome ha had primacy because it was the capital of the empire. Name me one. Just name me one church father that said that. One. They all said no, it was because of Peter, not anything else. Right. And it wasn't the capital of the empire after 330 anyway. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was at, at Chalcedon. Um, and, you know, okay, so let me ask you this, right? Now, well, first of all, speaking of Vatican I, what I like about it is it, it actually cites, Pastor Eterna cites the formula of Hermistas, which I find interesting because this uh, ended the Acacian Schism, and this was in 519. All right, so I just want to read a, a little tiny section here because it's very telling. It says, I promise that from now on, those who are separated from the communion of the Catholic Church, that is, clarified what that is, who are not in agreement with the Apostolic See, will not have their names read during the sacred mysteries. But if I attempt even the least deviation from my profession, I admit that, according to my own de declaration, I am, an accomplice, I am an accomplice to those whom I have condemned. So, basically, what it's saying is that 
let me go up actually. So we endorse and approve all the letters which Pope St. Leo wrote concerning the Christian religion. And so I hope I may deserve to be associated with you in the one communion which the Apostolic See proclaims in which the whole true and perfect security of the Christian religion resides. And, it said, and it's, it's interesting that it says those who are cut off from the communion of the Catholic Church, that it, speci it specifies what it means when it says that, that is who are not in agreement with the Apostolic See. So basically, if, according to the formula of Hermistas in 519, if you're at odds with the Apostolic See, you're not in Catholic communion. That's pretty strong language. Well, it, it is, but I mean, that's been the assumption from the be beginning. That's that's right. underlying everything we've been talking about because, you know, go back to Ignatius. If you're not in good standing with the bishop, you're not in the church. Well, the bishop, if the bishop is not in good standing with the bishop of Rome, Rome, yeah, right. So it, it's it's all that that connection. Uh, that matters. And, and the very definition of what a Christian is hinges on this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah like, you know, and, and I've heard people say, well, you guys make a big deal of, if Rome excommunicates you, you're basically, you know, up something's creek. But that's no big deal because uh, bishops excommunicated each other all the time. So an excommunication from Rome isn't any different. But Again, like you said, it's not there. Rome is not just another uh, C. It's not just he's not just another bishop. We've got something special here. And the fathers are pretty clear on this. Yeah, I think that's true. And, but also, I would say that, you know, this this argument that, uh, you know, well, bishops excommunicated each other all the time or, you know, um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of more more contemporary arguments along the same vein. There are all these these arguments from abuse um, yeah. that because something has been abused, therefore it's invalid, and I don't need to, you know, uh, take it into account. Yeah. And um, and and that's a that's a false argument. I mean, uh, you know, one of my favorite Latin phrases is you know, uh, abusus non tollit. Usum, right? Abuse does not take away use. Use, yeah. So, I learned that from Jimmy Aiken, actually. He was the first you, one to bring that to my attention on the show. I, yeah. I think he he probably got it from Bishop Barron. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's true. And, uh, you know, we we say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our version of that. Right. Um, and so, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, this was abused or that was abused or these people are bad. And therefore, eh, yeah, but you know, you're, you, if you distance yourself from it, you're just punishing yourself for somebody else's abuse. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now with regards to Vatican one, people often say, well, if you look at past returnists, for example, it talks about, you know, the uh, decision of the Bishop of Rome being irreformable. And if need be, the Pope can act alone and no one can override his decision. Basically, he doesn't have to consent. His decision is not bound up with the consent of the church, in other words. He can act He can act alone, and that act is binding. Now, they'll say that's not how the church was. The church was all about collegiality. And you take, for example, uh, Apostolic Canon 34, where it says the, let, uh, you know, the, the Bishop of Rome does no nothing without the consent of his brother bishops or something to that effect. So what is Vatican I actually saying here, and what is it not saying? Do you think people maybe misunderstand what is being conveyed here? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll preface this by saying I am not an expert on Vatican I, and um, anything that happened in 1870 feels like current events to me because uh, I live in the first millennium. But yeah. um, I don't see in Vatican I the idea that that you know the the pope would act alone mm -hmm. against the consensus of his colleagues um, right i don't the way i understand the spirit of that um i don't think uh that's what it meant but you know i mean i i have not read it recently so uh um I, i'm just you know i'm i'm hesitant to say too much but uh yeah but um, I feel like, it, you know, 
I, um, you know, I do these, uh, these tours to Rome, or at least I did before COVID. And, um, you know, I take my students into the Vatican and we, my, my students are mostly, well, they're all Protestant. They're mostly Methodist. Um, I'm Catholic. So we, uh, we, we do these ecumenical dialogue, uh, things where we talk to, uh, representatives in the Vatican who are involved in ecumenical dialogue yeah. with the Methodists. And then, you know, the, the, the Methodist person on the other side of that conversation. And, you know, for many years in a row, we, we had the privilege of sitting in the room in the Vatican where they actually have these conversations. Oh, wow. And, um, and one of the Vatican representatives said to me, you know, or said to the group, he said, you know, you, you have to think about the Pope, not as if the church is a train, if the church is like a train, the yeah. Pope is not the engine of the train pulling it along somewhere right. where it hasn't been. The Pope is the caboose right. announcing when the whole train has arrived at the station. Right. Yes. So yes. in other words, when the Pope makes a ex cathedra statement, mm -hmm. it is to announce that the that the the whole church, yes, including this the the faithful, have arrived at a place where he can say, "This is our faith." Not you know like top down. You have yes. to accept this thing that you never accepted before. No, right. but he can say, "This is our faith." So. Um, so, so for example, the one ex cathedra pronouncement that's the only one that's ever been done, apart from creating ex cathedra pronouncements, um, is uh, the Immaculate Conception, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or the assu um, uh, Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. Is it the Assumption or the... It's one of those two. Uh, I, I, the, assu the Assumption was Pope Pius the Twelfth. I, I want to say. Yeah, so... Yeah, so that that one should be at, at that time. So um, when when that became dogma, it this was not a pope saying, "I've decided you all have to believe this." And they're this like, was "Huh?" A pope saying, "I'm announcing to the world that we all believe this." Yes. In other words, now again, you know, Vatican one politics involved, lots going on, um, but but at the same time. Uh, you know, this is what what what's happening here is, you know, the Pope as caboose saying we have arrived at into this station. This is where we are not yeah. forcing it down people's throats. Yeah. And, you know, that's I'm so glad that you brought that up. So really, we get this um, we get this picture of like a pyramid. Right. People think that the Pope sits at the, sits at the top and whatever he says, kind of like even if it's cut from whole cloth, he foists it upon. The rest of the pyramid and it trickles down and that you just have to accept it or you're not part of the pyramid but what you said is exactly the reality and that is really what the pope's doing is speaking giving voice giving a unified voice to the unified faith of the church that's a, that's what it really is and, and the caboose is a great analogy right? yeah because, i mean i wish i could claim it as my own but you know um it was uh, it was it was one of the priests who work with the uh, Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity that that used that analogy with uh, with my group of students one time. So, and I I think it's very true. Yeah, absolutely. And for some perspective, when the dogma of the Assumption was proclaimed, or be, you know before leading up to it, let's say. So again, right? We think okay, the Pope is defining a dogma. So we have in the back of our head, well, so again, this is a, un a unitary act, right? He's at, he's, at, he's going solo. This is Vatican I. He's just by himself. But even in this extraordinary act of the magisterium, where it's the Pope pro proclaiming a dogma, this is intrinsically bound up with collegiality on, on two fronts. Number one, the one that you just mentioned, the Pope is merely proclaiming the faith of the church. Right, so there's a collective collegial element bound up with it there, but also in the very formulation of the dogma and what brings it about with the, the circumstances that bring about the proclamation itself. So the Pope is receiving letters and and pleas from the faithful, right? Please proclaim this dogma, and he's consulting with bishops, 
his brother bishops. He's consulting with theologians. So after this discernment process and hearing from the, the faith, the census fidelium, this is the yeah. faith of the, of the church people. So yeah. literally the, the Catholic church from the bottom up is working with the Holy Father to help him proclaim as one person the faith of the whole church. That is collegiality. That is synodality even within this extraordinary rare act of the magisterium at the highest level. There's a collegial element to it there. That cannot be overstated. Well, I think you're right. And I, I would I would go even farther than that and say it's ironic that that people think this is kind of a top-down pronouncement when in fact, especially with the Marian doctrines, you know, when you go back to the earliest history of the church and you look at the origin of the Marian doctrines, these are grassroots devotional practices yeah. that start at the bottom and work their way up. And the reason why it wasn't these things aren't pronounced until the 19th or 20th centuries is because that's how long it took them to get to the top. But the point right. is, is that these are not top down pronouncements. These are these are bottom up grassroots um devotional practices and beliefs you know that uh not not that they are unfounded that i mean they come from the earliest times of the church but it's just ironic that you know that people think that the pope forced something on people when in fact you know in, in essence he's the last to say it you know exactly he's the last to say what everybody's thinking i mean that's kind of <laughs> yeah it's a great way to put it uh, Heli actually wants to know where you teach. Oh, um, yeah. So I teach at a, a place called Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And um, it is the Methodist seminary for kind of the Midwest area. It's on the campus of Northwestern University. Uh, it's called Garrett Evangelical, Garrett hyphen evangelical. Uh, evangelical is not an adjective. It is the remnant of a merger between the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren denomination, and so um, it is a uh, it is a very progressive Protestant seminary. Um, I am the Catholic on the faculty of the Protestant seminary, teaching early and medieval church history, and I'm one of the more traditional slash Orthodox, I guess. Uh, faculty. Um, but my colleagues are great. And when they say they embrace diversity, they, they walk the talk and they accept me. And, and, uh, and it's ironic that I represent diversity in some ways, but there you go. <laughs> they had it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's where I teach. Yeah. That's awesome. She says, uh, I, I was a religious studies major at Gene oh, Crickets, I need my stronger glasses. Okay, let me put it up. I was a religious major at Centenary. Sen centenary. You familiar with uh, Centenary? Uh, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't know about that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, popes and ecumenical councils, right? So, what what was a pope's role at an ecumenical council? I mean, people have said, okay. If the Pope was such a big deal, he in the beginning he wasn't he wasn't calling ecumenical councils. Emperors were so basically what they say is the Pope once the empire splits in half, right? The East gets the emperor. Well, to fill the void, to fill the vacuum by necessity, the Pope becomes the emperor. So that's why he's got so much power in the West, and the East had never took hold because they had they kept their emperor, but the West needed an analogous figure. Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, the West is going to have their Holy Roman emperors, but the difference is that the popes sometimes, at least at the beginning, will be the ones to crown the Holy Roman emperors. So that sort of uh, demonstrates that the pope is above the emperor on the social ladder, whereas in the East, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. But but it's true. I mean, popes, <laughs> the pope's role at an ecumenical council is not to go but to send delegates. Now, yeah. to be fair, um, at the Council of Chalcedon for sure, and um, probably Ephesus as well, um, the popes were busy with barbarians at the door. Yeah. Um, but they did send delegates. And 
Pope Celestine uh, was the one who gave the authority to Cyril of Alexandria to chair the Council of Ephesus. So get this, even though he wasn't there, the yeah. Pope is the one who chose the chair of the Third Ecumenical Council, which was all the way in Ephesus. So that tells you something about the authority of the Pope. And then, of course, Leo sent his tome, uh, which was read at the Council of Chalcedon. So they send delegates, but, you know, for for reasons of, you know, various reasons, they they don't generally, they didn't generally go to the Eastern Councils. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so what about this? Okay, so when, we're, when we talk about what may what makes an ecumenical council ecumenical there's the you know the the popular reception theory where the church over time by the guidance of the holy spirit just kind of light comes on and says yeah this council is ecumenical the faithful receive it and that's kind of just how it is uh but you know what about what about the papal ratification theory is this is this a later development and it was kind of uh hoisted back and anachronistically onto mm. the church's history or really is that how it went the pope ultimately whether uh immediately thereafter or some time passes he has to ultimately ratify the act of a council for it to be binding yeah i think historically um there is not any explicit expectation that a bishop of rome has to endorse a council um now in the case where a bishop of rome rejects a council that will carry weight right mm. but but what makes a council ecumenical i think is two things up front at the time the emperor uh convenes uh invites every all the bishops of the world to the council and convenes the council why the emperor well a couple of reasons some political but also because the emperor has to be the one to give the bishops uh the authority to use the imperial uh, Pony Express system, if you will, yeah. to get there. So the, the the bishops are traveling on the emperor's dime. So the emperor has to authorize that. So the fact that an emperor calls a council, the fact that the invitations go out, in a sense, worldwide, means even if not every bishop of the world shows up, because we know they didn't, but if every bishop of the world is invited, there is a sense that the decisions of that council are going to be binding on worldwide Christianity. Mm -hmm. But I think what really makes a council ecumenical is when it is declared to be so by the next council. So in other words, um, you know, the council of Constantinople by accepting the creed of Nicaea and then of course, you know, adding to it, um, the council of Constantinople kind of makes Nicaea an ecumenical council, right. the council of Ephesus, councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, by saying, "We aren't writing a creed; we already have one." At the venerable councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, well, they've made now they've now made Constantinople an ecumenical council, and so it's kind of like recognition by a future council as ecumenical makes it ecumenical after the fact. Um, ecumenical, by the way, for if if anyone doesn't quite get that, it just means the whole thing, the worldwide church. So an ecumenical council is a council that represents the worldwide church as opposed to a regional council or a synod. Mm. And because a council is ecumenical, that implies at least that the decisions of the council are binding on worldwide Christianity. You know, of course, you know, we know that the, you know, the popes didn't like Canon 28 and all that, but, um, but that's the idea. So if a, if a Pope says, you know, after a council says, I don't like this thing, it's, uh, uh, we're not going with this. Would that, what kind of weight would that decision carry? Would that nullify, uh, in effect, nullify the council or at least a portion of it that was undesirable in the Pope's eyes? I mean, the, the, um, the, the council where Leo's tome was rejected. Yeah. He later called that the, the robber council, right? Right. So he rejects that council, and rightfully so, because it was because it was kind of manipulated by the heretics. But um, but in any case, he, I mean, we can assume that his rejection of that council carried some weight 
Although I kind of think that council would not have stuck anyway. I mean, because, you know, you know that in between the ecumenical councils, sometimes there are smaller councils held and sometimes yeah. the heretics will go off by themselves after they get excommunicated at a big council, they'll go off by themselves, have a smaller council, and they will declare their council to be the ecumenical council and they'll excommunicate the whole rest of the church. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, all yeah. kinds of drama. So, uh. um, so it's never neat and clean, but I think that at the end of the day, the answer to your question is that the more time goes on, hmm. the the less authority or the less weight a pope's acceptance or rejection of a council will carry, because by the time you get past the fifth century in the Council of Chalcedon, anyway, hmm. we're on this trajectory toward the split, anyway, right? So, right. you know, by the time you get to the sixth, seventh, eighth centuries. We're already on a trajectory toward 1054 and the split. And yeah. so the Eastern churches, the Eastern bishops are going to sort of increasingly, you know, turn a deaf ear to what Rome is saying. Right. Oh, I had something really, really interesting. And, you know, I haven't heard this reference very often, to be honest. I'm looking at St. Jerome's letter to Pope St. Damasus. Uh, really interesting stuff in here. Uh, in in St. Jerome, this is early, it's 4th century, so he's writing to the Pope about heretics. Um, so on the nature of Christ, you know, the nature of Christ and his divinity, humanity. Now, this is interesting because people say that, you know, the, the insertion, the unilateral insertion of the filioque in the creed was was overstep right and we hear that touted about quite frequently but listen to this from saint jerome to pope saint damasus all right so he says if you pope think it fit to enact a decree then i shall not hesitate to speak of three hypostases listen to this this is a this is a bomb Order a new creed to supersede the Nicene. And then, whether we are Arians or Orthodox, one confession will do for us all. That's the first part I wanted to read. He literally thought that Pope Damasus could not only for, forget adding a word to a creed, thought that he had the, author the papal authority to write not only a new creed by himself, but by himself write a new cre new creed to replace the Nicene Creed, and it would be binding and sufficient. This is this is uh, yeah. pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, although you know, I would have to say, I mean, this is one of those places where you know Jerome is speaking for Jerome, and that would not be the consensus of the Church Fathers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the the thing about it is, is that. Like we were talking about ecumenical councils, right? Mm -hmm. An ecumenical council has ecumenical authority. A regional council has regional authority. Yeah. The question you're getting at would be, you know, what if the Pope wrote a new creed? Would that be the creed of the church at Rome? Or would that be the new creed of the entire worldwide church? I mean, it didn't happen. So we'll, yeah. we'll never know the answer to that. Sure. Um, but, but the filioque is a whole, that should be a, a topic for another whole discussion. Like we need an yeah, hour and a sure. half on for the sure. filioque and I can do it. We can do that. <laughs> okay. But we can't do it now. I mean, and, but I'll just say to, um, I'll just, I'll, I'll just give us a little bit of an Easter egg, uh, to, to our Orthodox brothers and sisters. You're probably going to like what I have to say, <laughs> um, <laughs> in some ways, maybe not everything I have to say. Um, but, uh, uh, but I mean, I think Jerome is, is just flattering the Pope at this point. Mm. Um, and he's, he's using a bit of hyperbole to say that he believes so strongly in mm. papal authority that, you know, if the Pope should say the grass is blue and the sky is green, then, you know, gosh, darn it. I'll believe it. You know, that's kind of right. what he's doing there, you know? That's that's interesting though. Even though that's his view, 
you can find it as early as the fourth century. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the reason I brought that up is to say this isn't some sort of, you know, medieval exaggeration or it, you could find, you could find it early on, right. which I think is, sure. is pretty significant. And you can say the same about the Filioque. The Filioque is not some like late edition. I mean, it's, it's right. there pretty early. I mean, you can see it in Ambrose and certainly in Augustine and yeah. Um, yep. But the question yeah. is, the question is whether they should have added it to the creed. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's another whole topic. But uh, yeah, and uh, we just do that sometime we will, we will. And I just wanted to read, uh, you know, just again to show, um, you know, what what a, what a holy father would say about the Pope. And and this is interesting language. Now, this isn't flattery. I don't think this is just straight. This is par for the course. He says, my words are spoken to the successor of the fisherman, to the disciple of the cross. I follow no leader save Christ, so I communicate with none but your blessedness, that is, with the chair of Peter. Um, for this I know is the rock on which the church is built. This is the house where alone the paschal lamb can be rightly eaten. This is the ark of Noah, and he who is not found in it shall perish when the flood prevails. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's standard. That's standard. Not I think that is, I think that, I think he, he speaks for the consensus of the church fathers there. And again, in that sense that if you're not in communion with Rome, if you're not in good standing with Rome, if you're not in agreement with Rome, you're not in the church, capital C, you know, yep. Yep. Um, that certainly would be, would, would be the consensus there. Um, but again, once we start getting into the fifth century, sixth, and then later, you start to see, especially in the East, you start to see some places where there is more loyalty to uh, a city mm. or to a kind of a, a, an ethnic church than to the universal church. So you start to see in Alexandria, for example, you know, th this, this feeling that, you know, there's a loyalty to the, the church of Alexandria above the universal church, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's Alexandria and me against the world, then you know I don't need the world. I, I you know, so you you do start to see that, um, right? Later, yeah, yeah. So you know what? For our next show, why don't we kind of cover the uh, dynamics, the factors that led up to the East-West schism, and of course, within that, we'll have to cover the filioque. I think that would be yeah. very good. Um, yeah. Uh, Teresa says, uh, my son converted to Catholicism while at Evangelical Seminary in Charlotte, now PhD student at Catholic U of America. Your students may be co convert because of you, Dr. Papandrea. Well, I, you know, I, I do, <laughs> I do get, um, course evaluations that say he's trying to convert us to Catholicism. Um, I'm really not trying to convert them to Catholicism. I'm just teaching them what Good. the early and medieval church was like. What they're what they're realizing is just how Catholic it was. Now, yeah. I think the same argument could be made for for the Orthodox. You could make the argument that if you study the early church, you're going to realize just how Orthodox, with a capital O, it is. But yes. the point is, is that if you're Protestant, you've been told all your life that the Protestant Reformation was about getting back to some version of original Christianity. But when you actually study original Christianity, you find that's not true. So, so they're, you know, they, they do sort of have that light bulb go off over their head, but you know, my students are generally uh, folks who are headed toward um, ordination in a Protestant denomination. And so they're, you know, sort of, they're, they're, they're probably unlikely to convert to Catholicism uh if they feel that they're called to ministry in that way. So, um, but you never know. Hey, I'm sure you've planted a lot of seeds. Uh, be interesting to see how God uh, waters those seeds. Um, Haley says, my favorite is when they dig up dead popes, excommunicate them, and then chop off their fingers and toss them in the river. Yeah, okay, the good that old... happened like twice. I mean, yeah, <laughs> the, the cadaver synod. Yeah. 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 I know there's, a, you know, there's a lot of weirdness in church history. There's a lot of stuff where truth is stranger than fiction, but uh, you know, we're dealing with humans here. What are you going to do? Exactly. And you know, the cool thing is, and you know, my, my, uh, one of my friends, he, he used to, when he was, uh, he was kind of between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, you know, here and there, but he, uh, he said, you know, 
one of the things that I could do, I could be an atheist or I could be a Buddhist. And the funny thing is he's actually Buddhist now, but he said, I could be an atheist or I could be a Buddhist and I could write objective church history. And it just so happens without trying to uh, skew the evidence or special plead or, you know, any of that, try to hoodwink somebody just so happens. The data says the church is Catholic. And like you said, you, you're not trying to convert people. You're simply relating the facts of church history. And it's pretty cool. And I, I think it's providential, of course, that uh, it just so happens to show that the church is Catholic. And, and, the, and you know, like you said, the Orthodox, you can make, you can make the same claim. However, I think, it, as you said, the, the witness of the fathers is there's something special about Rome. So yeah. obviously we pray and hope for full communion, but that is something that can't be ignored. This this papacy isn't a medie medieval in invention. It's not a barnacle. It's not some captivity of the church. This is this is consensus patrum. Like this is what yeah. it is. No, I, I agree. And and I mean, you know, obviously I I I I was baptized Catholic, but I was raised in a Protestant denomination. So I came back to the Catholic Church because I decided it was the most faithful expression of Christianity. Um, nothing against the Orthodox, uh, but, you know, I just decided that that was, the, that was the church for me. And so there would be nothing wrong with trying to convert people to Catholicism. It's just not my calling. I'm called to be a catechist, not an apologist. So that's mm -hmm. what I do. I just, I just teach, teach the way it was and People do with the information what they what they will, you know. Yep, wherever the chips fall, right? Yeah. Well, uh, brother Jim, uh, it's been a absolute pleasure again. I had some laughs this time, and I cracked a few corny jokes that I've been <laughs> holding on to. So thanks for humoring me. Uh, thank you to Teresa and Hallie for the good questions and comments. Yeah. And oh, let me let me just re uh, mention. Oh, hey Tom, Tom just popped in. Um, just want to mention that, guys, I was mentioning before how I was going to do a book giveaway once I hit 500 subscribers. I accidentally forgot to do a announcement uh, about it. So I'm now at 512. So thank you very much for your continued support. And may God bless you for that. So I'm going to give away a book for free. And it's for U.S. and Canadian residents. Um, so what I'm going to actually do is give away... Uh, Jim's book, which he has right here, handed down, uh, The Catholic Faith of the Early Christians. And the reason I'm giving this book away, number one, it had a profound effect on me personally. I loved reading it. I actually gave it to a friend of mine. And it really is a great overall survey of the teachings of the historic church from the earliest times. And so it covers a wide variety of subjects, the Eucharist, the papacy, intercession of saints, you name it. It's a great primer. So it would be useful for you as a Catholic if you just want to, you know, grow deeper in your faith or if you want to give it to somebody as a gift to say, hey, if you're interested in, in what we believe, why don't you take a look at this? It might help soften them up or, uh, you know, address some misconceptions that, or misperceptions that they may have. And it could be a great tool for evangelization. So, uh, yeah, uh, Teresa says, thank you, Dustin and Dr. Papandrea, for an interesting episode. God bless you. And, yeah, guys, please uh, make sure you visit uh, Dr. Papandrea's YouTube channel and check out his series, The Original Church. Uh, you want to plug? You have a website, right? You want to you plug that, uh, Jim? Well, yeah. So if you, if you type in whenthechurchwasone.com, one is O N E when the church was one.com that should take you right to um, my, uh, my YouTube channel with the playlist of my, uh, my series, the original church. And it is fantastic. It's, it's nice bite-sized segments, but there's a lot to chew on. So I definitely uh, recommend those. And uh, I did want to actually thank, uh, thank you, Jim, because you hooked me up with uh, David Eastman, Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Coming out with a book on uh, the contribution of North African Christianity. Yep. So yep. Uh, uh, David has graciously sent me a book uh, via Lydia um, at Baker Academic, which I really, really appreciate. I'm looking forward to meeting and speaking with David. Great. We're actually doing it next Tuesday, or all right, yeah, uh, yeah, this coming Tuesday. 
And uh, so that'll be great. Um, and I also have, um, I'm going to be on the Classical Theism podcast with uh, John DeRosa in early September. I want to say around the 9th or 8th. And I'm also going to have him on my channel uh, on one of those two days. We're going to do like a back-to-back. -back. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And I hope to have Dr. Margaret Barker on soon once her computer gets repaired. Uh, Tom just subscribed. Thank you, Tom. God bless you. And uh, I guess I will close out the show uh, by saying you've been watching and listening to Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise and thy sight is incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 41 with Dr. Jim Papandrea on the development of the papacy and other miscellaneous related issues in the first millennium. And of course, we did go beyond that with Vatican I, but I think it was a nice uh, tie in there. So uh, thank you, Brother Jim. I appreciate you as always. And our next episode will be on the East-West split. And of course, uh, the filioque is implicit in that. So uh, we will do that for sure. And I will end the broadcast right now in three, two, one. God bless.